Hey, there's a rumor out there that you got voter fatigue. How could that possibly be? The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Takeo Comfort Solutions. Our friend freelance journalist Neil Rubinton is here to uh, talk about the primary. Oh, yeah, this, oh, we have a primary coming up Tuesday. Come on, jumping jacks, everybody, let's go. This is great stuff. Yeah. But Brown Poll uh, reportedly didn't find you feeling that way. Uh, Neil will tell us about that coming up. And uh, we'll check into our mutual states of mind. How are you? It is good to have you. Thanks for joining me. What a spring day this was. Let's go to the rundown and check some of the news. Unfortunately, this is tragic for, for so many people. Uh, Yikes, out of nowhere, roll tape. Police and security officials gathered outside Paisley Park Studios in Chenhassen, Minnesota, where Prince recorded so many of his hits. It was just before 10 a.m. when they responded to a medical emergency. Hours later, Prince's publicist confirmed that he was dead. He was born Prince Rogers Nelson in Minneapolis in 1958 and grew to become one of the most recognized and decorated recording artists of all time. Prince showed a natural talent for music, composing his first song at age seven. Through his teenage years, he learned to play most of the instruments on his first few albums. His sound and style was an unmistakable blend of funk, rock, R&B, soul, pop, and dance music. Part of what Prince did was he played, just like David Bowie did, with images. Prince became an international movie star in 1984 with the release of Purple Rain, which won two Grammys and an Oscar for Best Original Song Score. Oh, no, let's go. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2004. One of the interesting things uh, about him is that he did keep his private life sh so shrouded. Um, we're talking about an artist who, as he became a bigger star, refused to grant interviews. Last week, Prince was hospitalized with the flu after his plane made an emergency landing en route to a concert in Atlanta. Prince was 57 years old. Oh, man, way too young, right? Just, oh, my goodness. You know, when he used to sing, you know, Party Over 1999, I used to say, stop. He's freaking me out. I'm thinking the whole thing is going to blow in 2000, you know, Y2K and all of that. But, you know, I, I have to tell you, I have to admit, when I used to watch Prince, and I'm only a couple years younger than him, I'd think, come on, man, you are too weird. You know, I felt the same way about David Bowie. The truth of the matter is, is that I loved David Bowie's music when I wasn't looking at him, and I loved Prince's music when I wasn't looking at him, which made me think, you're a jerk for not looking at him. And so I enjoyed him. But it was a process with Prince. Uh, he'll be sorely missed. Uh, not sure what happened. I'm sure we'll find out over time. All right, let's come back home. Once upon a time, there was a state rep named Don Lally. And the state rep named Don Lally uh, resigned his position and became an employee in the Gina Raimondo administration. Now, how and why did that happen? Well, it's because the Speaker of the House decided that he was going to make a deal. And, you know, Gina Raimondo uh, tried to fake that she wasn't making a deal, that she made a legitimate hire. Listen to this. We hired him into the governor's office to help us on regulatory streamlining and some special projects in the Department of Business Regulation. He's the guy we chose to do the job, and we're going to hold him accountable, just like everybody else. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, guess what? How about a headline? A ah, little problem here. Uh, Representative Lally has resigned. Why? Because the Ethics Commission was about to lay the boom on him because his employment uh, violated every open door law that the state of Rhode Island has. I opined last time that we talked about this that the governor should have just been transparent and say, yeah, I hired a hack in order to be able to make a deal with the speaker on some other thing that benefits the state. Instead, you know, she tried to feign the legitimacy of it. And they must have, uh, coming down to crunch time here, decided that, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Lally, it's about time that you offered your resignation. The GOP was the, uh, the group that actually made the complaint to the State Ethics Commission. And now the chairman, Brendan Bell, says he wants Lally to pay all the money back since he's been hired since last July. That'd be a pretty big chunk of change, probably, I don't know, sixty or seventy thousand dollars out of his eighty seven thousand dollar year salary buried in the Department of Business Regulation, small business liaisoning. I'm guessing that the money won't be paid back, and I'm thinking that the request is probably over the top, but it is kind of funny. Speaking of funny, funny interesting, not funny haha, -ha, check out this headline. So I was reading Randall Edgar's piece in the Providence Journal today. He's now a columnist there, reporter turned columnist, I guess. Uh, and I saw this little excerpt in it, and I almost fell over and went boom. 
He was writing about the line item veto and how Charlie Baker in Massachusetts has one and Gina Raimondo doesn't, meaning Rhode Island doesn't and Massachusetts does. And she is quoted, our governor is quoted as saying, I would love the line item veto. We're an outlier in the country on that. It would make this government more efficient and more in line with the rest of the country. All she's got to do is step up on this and the uh, legislative grant program, which I affectionately call the rub. And, uh, and you know what? She's going to make a huge comeback on Dan York's state of mind. Senator Ed O'Neill was in North Carolina listening to my radio show weekdays noon to 3 on WPRO, streaming while he was driving, was so excited he called me. Uh, when I heard the news, uh, I was uh, very pleased, uh, a little bit confused because uh, I've introduced that bill um, two sessions in a row, and we could not get anybody from the governor's office to come testify or uh, send a letter of support. No support at all, period. Uh, I know. We had uh, hearings on the bill in the Senate Judiciary Committee, so I'm glad that uh, the governor may be seeing the light. That certainly is encouraging. Yeah, that would be the single most productive and profound thing that the governor could do. I don't know why she whispered it to Randall Edgar. Gina, shout it from the mountaintop. Let's go, Governor. In the meantime, come on, really, look at this. Look, Elizabeth Warren ain't going to be second fiddle to Hillary Clinton. I can't wait to talk to Noel about this. By the way, it's Noel, not Neil. My guest, I'm talking about. Noel Rubinton. He says it happens all the time. I have to apologize every time I screw his name. I don't know. I got a Noel Neal problem. Anyway, I'll apologize in a minute. Anyway, fat chance. Okay, listen, I know America is evolving, but it ain't that evolved. If you think that the Donald Trump's best news, if he comes to not, any, any, any Republican, best news will be that there's two women on the ticket on the Democratic side. Not a chance. We ain't ready yet. You may dispute that. I'm here weeknights. Try the veal. Uh, Target restrooms. So this is interesting. So first, Kurt Schilling got whacked from ESPN for his opining about, you know, a guy born with a who should be able to go to the bathroom with a who, and if they don't have a who, and if they don't have a who, you know, because athletes are very focused on their who. Now, I used to be an athlete. And, uh, you know, we're very focused on our home. In fact, most men are very focused on our home. Because it's all about our home. And God forbid our home ain't her anymore. <laughs> right? Popped by ESPN. Now, that's their problem, not mine. But uh, then <laughs> you get this from Target today. Uh, you know what? doesn't matter what you got a home. You can go in the bathroom that you identify with, regardless of whether you got a home or not. All right? Stephen Alexander, uh, our friend of the program, a local young man who is a teacher, an educator, and who used to be Jennifer, talked to me about it on the radio today. It's sad. North Carolina and, and Mississippi, that's, that's sad. I think that, the, you know, there's been a lot of um, fear-based propaganda out there when the general overall consensus is, you know, trans people, um, we've been marginalized. We, in, um, and we've been in fear. Uh, more than anything. Uh, you know what? This is complicated for a lot of people. I think those who hyperbolize the worry about crisis in the bathroom really ought to take a deep breath. Crisis in the locker room may be another situation. Uh, at the same time, those who are transgendered have started thinking about that they're making progress and acceptance, and with that comes being smart. Uh, Stephen will join us next week on the program as this bathroom why is everything out of set all 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 things end up in the bathroom you know it's, it's amazing it's at the center of our universe that's why we're so worried about it all the time all right uh the center of the universe these days is the primary yes no how about this headline from our guest hypothesizing and 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 freaking me out with this hypothesis this is the opinion piece in newsday uh from noel Sorry, man. I mean, how many times you got to be on the show for me to get it right, for <laughs> God's sake? Um, you're a good man. Good to see you. What are you doing with this headline? What are you doing? What are you trying to say? Well, I think trying to kind of normalize the situation. You know, going back to 1912, when there were four candidates, four major candidates in the race, Woodrow Wilson, William Howard Taft, Theodore Roosevelt, and Eugene Debs. 
and the, the republic survives. Everybody is so scared that candidates running outside of the Democratic and Republican labels are going to ruin the system. All right, so is, are you suggesting uh, by legitimizing the possible existence of a four-way that you might think there will be? I think there's a, a small chance. I think that Bernie Sanders has all the characteristics of somebody that somebody needs to run an independent campaign. You know, He's no got enormous passion, enormous money. You might be the only guy in America. Could be. I'd be the first. Right, seriously, writing or talking about it, because while the Trumpian, them, you know, independent this way, third candidate, Mitt Romney, but some kind of side view, Republican backdoor worry, I've never heard a word Everybody about Bernie Sanders idea. making the same kind of decision. Everybody has the idea that Bernie will fall into line. Right. But that's a kind of a condescending point of view for somebody who was outspent, out fundraised Hillary Clinton. So I think it may temper how the Clintons treat him because they realize he could have an option. You know, I feel like I could have had a V8 and I'm mad at myself. How come I never came up with that for conversation <laughs> with you? More jewels, gems from Noel when we come back. Stay with us. You were telling me the same thing. Hey, we're back. So Noel is a one for one and shocking me. Why didn't I think Bernie Sanders could run independent? We'll talk more about that, but here's the latest on the primary season. After delivering a toned down victory speech in New York, Donald Trump returned to his outspoken rhetoric in Maryland Wednesday night. We got lion Ted, we have crooked Hillary. I won't go over the others because they're now defeated. Just 393 delegates shy of clinching the GOP nomination, Trump has vowed to become more presidential. We had a really, really good day in New York yesterday. After scoring a decisive win over Bernie Sanders in New York, Democrat Hillary Clinton campaigned in Pennsylvania, saving her toughest jabs for her Republican rivals. When I hear Donald Trump and Ted Cruz talk about international issues, I mean, what they say is not only offensive, it's downright dangerous. Going forward, the Vermont senator would need to win 73% of the remaining delegates to capture the Democratic nomination. Not if he goes independent, just ask Noel. I think that he has such a rabid following on the progressive socialist side that they'd run through a wall for him. Yeah, but I think what people saw in the New York primary is there's a ceiling for him too. That he had these incredible rallies in Brooklyn, for example, he had two rallies with 20,000 people and he got totally destroyed in Brooklyn in the election because so many of his supporters either aren't registered to vote as Democrats or live in some other area or younger people who aren't that motivated to vote. So he has his problems too. So how do you see a four-way since you've been imagining it and writing about it? How do you see that? That's Donald Trump getting uh, outmaneuvered at the convention right. and saying, you know what, the hell with you, I'm going to. That's, that's kind of how you see the thing. And it would be out. a Cruz or a Kasich or a Ryan. Are we, you know, we've been hammering around about this for quite some time. Are we uh, really looking at an open convention that could thwart Trump's nomination still? Do you really think so? Well, I think the the high-level Republicans will have to have a very strong stomach to do it because Trump is clearly going to get close to the 1237 he needs and they're going to have to be able to withstand this idea that they're thwarting democracy because that's what Trump is going to do but this used to be n pretty common you know even in the primary era if you go back to 1976 you had an open convention but before primaries it was very common Woodrow Wilson in that election 1912 I talked about he was nominated at the Democratic convention on this 46th ballot what do you have coming in? What do you have coming in in terms of? Well, remember there are no primaries. Right. So, so it was right. just, it was like just no a sense it was just of who the supporter. It was a, li it was a real convention. Right. It was let's let's start and we'll make this nomination. We right could from, have from could the have a real convention, and I think some people would be excited by that idea. Trump uh, will hammer the, away. At the it. media would be excited about it. That's for sure. Right. Ratings would be high. Uh, Americans would claim again, a, a thwarting of democracy without really paying attention to the history and the rules as they're presented. And 
uh, it will be a heck of a civics education for America if the party rules are adjusted such right. that he gets hammered. On the so. other hand, though, the Trump idea that if I, oh, if I get 1,150 delegates, which is you know, 100 short of what he needs, I should be the nominee. I mean, that, how does that make sense? The idea is it's majority rules. So he's got to get to that. Kasich is still hanging around, hanging around, hanging around, hoping that this whole thing becomes an implosion between Cruz and Trump. Are you one of those people who believes that he's still got a viable place in this thing? Well, if, or that he's whistling Trump, Dixie? If Trump can be stopped, well, the Providence Journal has a strong editorial for him, New York Times, many papers around the country are kind of trying to put him up as the grown-up in the race. He's coming to Bryant University on Saturday to do a town hall. So he's trying to get somewhere here, you think, but uh, you know, I think the, all the odds are that Trump is going to sweep Rhode Island. Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. However, um, that's a problem in and of itself. The uh, the idea that that Trump's going to sweep Rhode Island. Don't we have a headline on? on do we did, did we did we put that? On? Thank you. That's very nice. GOP rules limit upside for Trump in the Rhode Island victory. We have a pretty confounded Rhode Island right. setup for delegates. Can you explain it to anybody? Well, it's like in a lot of other places, like New York that, and California, that you just you don't get. It's not proportional with the percent you get in the election right. because there, there are too many other rules. Districts, three districts, three for right. a district here, three for a district here. You got your overall, you got your statewide, and then you got your uh, equivalent of super delegates. Right, so you're unbound. Um, so it, it could very well be possible that Donald Trump gets the you know 50, 60 percent of the uh, the votes on Tuesday of next week and doesn't get all of the and doesn't get the majority right. of the delegates. Right. Well, in Pennsylvania. Going in with much, many more delegates, we know that's the situation because there's so many unbound delegates. Which will buoy his argument that the fix is in. Right. Of course. But this is the system he signed on to run it. I, I just don't think that a lot of people are going to say that he was thwarted if by the rules that he knew. Going did, in. Did, did you see something that I didn't? I mean, did he go back to Lion's Head and, and Hillary Clinton? That was interesting. In one day. I mean, I thought he was actually going to build a little bit of. Presidential temperament moment, uh, momentum, New York Tuesday night, calling Cruz, Senator Cruz, actually, you know, comporting himself with some kind of discipline, and then he's right back to it. Well, his new chief handler, Paul Manafort, is trying to get him to focus that way. But he obviously, it's hard to retrain somebody. And today, he did a, a town hall kind of interview on the Today Show, and he talked about how he thought the, the law in North Carolina, back to your bathroom issue, should be overturned and that people should be able to go to the bathroom where they want to go to the bathroom. So he's trying to, you know, present a, a warmer, fuzzier, kind of more presidential image. But, you know, I think some people question whether he can really do that consistently. And that, that clip that you showed you know, showed that he still has that in his head. Old dogs, new tricks. I don't know. Under stress, you usually break down. It's like the golf swing. You may learn something <laughs> new. You play the game at all? No. Uh, you, you know, you learn something new. You go, ah, that's it. I'm a new guy. And then on the range, it's great. And then, you know, 17th hole on a $2 yeah. Nassau, all of a sudden, the old thing comes back under yeah. pressure. Same thing in the election season, right? Definitely. When we come back, Noel uh, ran into some information about the new Brown poll coming out and how we feel about the candidates. You might be underwhelmed. Stay with us. Yes, there is he who could run independently, according to my guest and his column. And you know what? I don't think it's a wacky consideration. By the way, I know you see he's got a ceiling, but in a four-candidate right. race, anything could happen. Right. We've seen that here in Rhode Island. Have you ever met Lincoln Chafee? Right. Right? Seriously. Uh, but one of the fascinating things of the lessons of 1912 was... Wilson won with 42%, and Roosevelt, I think, at 33 and it went down from there. But Wilson had about 90% of the electoral votes. So even in a four-way race, somebody can be dominating. Hmm. So it's, it's not, again, it's nothing, I don't think anything to be scared of. That's the other phenomenal thing. You get on the radio and you listen to people, and the, the phone lines ring, and I love my listeners and the people who dial the show, but you want to talk about fit to be tied trying to explain the convention delegate process and then trying to explain the Electoral College. Right. Uh, of course, you know, hanging chads did a lot to <laughs> bring everybody into a little bit of an understanding. There's a bunch of difference between the popular vote and the Electoral College. So 
You know, I have noticed over the course of, uh, I would say, the last month or so, that even when I bring up something that's interesting for people to talk about, they don't. And that is, on the radio, this primary season has gone flatline for phone traffic. I think everyone is just, and I think you have some information that probably buoys that. Tell me. Yeah, there was something interesting this afternoon. Uh, the Brown Taubman Center was supposed to release their next poll on the Professor election. Professor Marone, I can't wait to have him in. And instead, they said this Wednesday? afternoon. Wednesday? Oh, good. They said this afternoon that they weren't going to release it until Sunday. And when they started to explain what it was, they said they had an unusual number of incomplete surveys, which they thought were related to voter fatigue. Which is, you know, I think that they were being very honest about what the problem was, but also shows that, you know, I think it, it speaks to what you were talking about, that people are tired out. Which I think is also an interesting issue with Hillary Clinton, because here's a woman who people, a lot of people have Clinton fatigue, and I think a lot of the reasons that people, a lot of people think that she has such high negatives is people want to, just don't want to hear it anymore. They don't want any more Clintons. And that's one of the things that she has to surmount. Yeah, you know, it's almost as if the uh, the gender dynamic in this hasn't really even percolated. She's a, she's made an effort to make it a conversation, and I'm sure it will be, but really it hasn't, because of the name, because of the familiarity, because of that, I think she's perceived, to her credit maybe, into the history of her, her she and, and, and her husband, more of a Clinton than a woman, if, if that makes any sense, is it right? No, I think that's true. However, do you subscribe to my theory that she choosing a running uh, a female r running mate is an impossibility? It would be unusual. It'd be a lot of change all at once. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, California elected two women senators. I'm right. not sure there's been another example. Not Feinstein many. and Boxer. Right. right. So I think that I think it, I think most people would believe it would be kind of too much at once. Even though that's unfair that we should judge people on their own, but it would be a lot of change all at once. Yeah, I, I, I'm not saying personally that I, can, I, I, that I couldn't tolerate it as, and I want to make sure everybody understood what I meant in the rundown tonight. It's not that I don't, that I couldn't tolerate it or trust it. I don't think America is ready for it. What does that mean? I'm more evolved? I don't know. I don't, maybe I'm not. I, you know, I'll let you go to the bathroom anywhere if you want to. Um, crazy stuff. All right, you know, you're on a closer interval now. You got a gut check as to what's going to happen here? Oh, I still think that Bernie has a chance you do. to win Rhode Island. Although, the fact that well, he's not coming. Well, winning Rhode Island is whatever. Oh, you mean altogether? Altogether. I, and I think Trump is going to win here. Uh, you mean altogether? I, I'm still a believer that we're headed to an open convention. I think there's enough, it's going to be close enough, and there are enough people who want to make it happen that whether Trump still could emerge from it, because he might be able to. You know, convince the last people, but I think we're going to go to a convention where he doesn't have the majority. And the Democrats. Would you put any of your hard-earned journalistic cash? Not that this is a concept that makes any sense. Not so much. Would you put uh, your money on Trump getting the nomination, or do you think in an open convention he's going to get he's going to get whacked? I think if it's an open convention, he's going to lose. I think he knows that. So that's why he's going to work so hard. So he's going to try. Remember the last primary is June 7th, June 8th right. in California. That's a lot of time before Cleveland, so he could work on all those people so that he could go into the convention with the majority, even though if he, even if he doesn't win enough delegates. Got it. Fascinating. Good piece. Four-way. Right. Think about it. Always nice to see you. All righty. Uh, final word and we come back. Stay with us. So, tomorrow night begins Passover, and we're going to spend some time tomorrow night on the show describing it, making sure everybody understands what it means. It'll be fun. See you on the radio, too, tomorrow. Got to go. Bye.